Hello, Mike. How are Hello, you? Hello, John. Yeah, of course. Good. Good, thanks. Good to see you. Well, uh, here we are in um, a major uh, community of the rangelands. This is known as the Acacia Woodlands. Um, can you tell us a little bit about them? Well, John, it's probably originally more of a grassland with scattered trees and its dominated cover is its dominant cover is Mitchell grass and the, the scattered trees are Boree, Gigi and, and leopard wood here and uh, they just get thicker and thicker and move onto the grassland. The natural process of fire sweeping them back that occurred one, two hundred years ago and earlier just isn't there anymore. <laughs> The early settlers feared fire because they, they had some terrible fires in the early days. Fires had killed people, fires had swept across entire properties and, and beyond. They, they, they fought those fires, they ploughed breaks and they reduced the potential for fire to be the, the, the d dynamic part of the landscape that it has been for thousands and thousands of years. So vegetation changed. Old, older people talk about country you could see a mile or two through and it was easy to muster, it was easy to travel through. Quite a bit of that country is now much thicker, it's much denser. You might, you might see only a few hundred metres. Well Mike, I've noticed walking through this area that we're getting a, a number of different um, size classes of all these acacia shrubs. What does that uh, tell us here about the, uh, the recruitment process that's been going on? I guess the big wet years, that's what it's all about. So every 10, 15 years or so, we have a well above average rainfall event. And in some cases, it's several years in a row when we have really good rains. So mid 1950s, 70s and 1990 and so on. Uh, every so often, there's this wonderful wet period and all of these seedlings result and uh, encroach further into the open grassland. I think if you could allow the grass to build up and burn it in a more moderate fire, but then follow that with, a, with another one or two after that, so you get a, an incremental effect with fire, that would probably be the, the most practical tool that we, we've got available to us at the moment. So it means that those areas would have to be regrassed, allowed to burn, regrassed, allowed to burn. So they're really going to be set aside from, from grazing for perhaps 10 years or more. So we're in a patch of uh, Gigi encroachment here. Um, this is pretty thick. Uh, what are the implications for, for livestock production and also for biodiversity? In terms of biodiversity, it's changed a heck of a lot. The, group, the perennial grasses were once here with the whole range of grass dependent uh, birds and, and marsupials and rodents just aren't here anymore, so that's changed. Uh, the, there's not the grazing potential, there's not the, 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 the rich tapestry of biodiversity. You tend to get a, a more narrow spectrum of biodiversity and uh, it, it, yeah, the, world's, the world's changed forever. But uh, yeah, that, that, that's, that's the case here, John. So what could we do with, um, with large areas of this? What's, what, what are the management options? So for, for someone managing this land, uh, thinning this out in some way would be a wonderful thing to do. And uh, that, that's, that's commonly done by uh, thinning it using a bulldozer or perhaps a, a tie, rubber tied loader with a stick rake. And it's an expensive process. It, it, it's probably verging on the point of uneconomic, but in some parts of a property where you want to get an easy to muster paddock, you, you, the, you've got a priority to improve your carrying capacity. Landholders who own those machines may well consider that a priority. Well, Mike, this is, uh, this is actually uh, a bit depressing. Uh, I think we might um, go off and, uh, and have a couple of beers and um, think about how we might drown our sorrows or perhaps things will look better through some beer goggles. It can only help, John. Thanks, Mike. If I was managing for thinking of how will I ma better manage for climate variability, I'd be looking from this environment to, or not so much this environment, but say in the North American context, to an environment which already is in that dynamic, the same dynamic of, of say, and so for example, if your rainfall variability is 20 or 30%, and suddenly you've got to dial in 70% or 50%, where can I go that has a similar environment that's already dealing with those issues? And I think that's probably a, a pretty in interesting study in itself. <laughs>